يا إله الكون قد أسلمت لك يا إله الكون قد أسلمت لك يا إله الكون قد أسلمت لك رب فاغفر زلتي ما أحكمك أبتغي قدر الله ما شاء إنا لله وإنا إليه Whatever you go through it is خير Even as the Prophet even the, the brick of a thorn it is also that is خير it expiates the sin and no one of us can say he is not sin, he is sinless no he has no sins and if you don't have sins then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also elevates you in the in the Jannah so you are a winner and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only he tests those whom he loves إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدَ لِبْتَلَاهُ When Allah loves you, He tests you. So that is a sign that Allah loves you. The sins they expiate, they wash away the sins. They, they, they test, they wash away the sins. Kafara, expiators. So the Muslim always, that's why Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. All praise to Allah under all circumstances. Whatever happens, it is khair. Whatever happens is what? It's khair. Alhamdulillah. You see, it gives you what? Eternal peace. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. One of the salaf said to his brother, Are all your neighbors happy with you? All your neighbors, no one. All of them, they are fine, happy with you. He said, yes. He said, check yourself. Something wrong with you. That means because your neighbors, all of them cannot be huh? Malaika, angels. That means you don't enjoy what is right and you don't forbid what is evil. That's why everyone is happy with you. The moment you start enjoying what is right and forbid what is evil, not everyone will be happy with you. Not everyone. That's why we are not better than the prophets of Allah. They had enemies. They had opponents to their message. So the same thing will happen to you. But you say, Alhamdulillah. I am moving in the right direction and doing what Allah commanded me to do. The consequences, the results, Allah I don't, I don't care and what might happen. I, I'm just delivering it. I'm moving. Who oh guides? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My reward, I'll get it in the air. After, don't you know, brothers and sisters, on the day of resurrection, the our promise will come alone. Prophets, Allah sent them to their people, and they didn't listen to them. No one believed. And this prophet will come on that day by himself, and he delivered the message. But his reward, he will get it from Allah. So the da'is and this, it should carry on. You should not think of the audience and the gathering. MashaAllah, there are the gathering, the hundreds and thousands. So what? That should not be the, the problem that should preoccupy your mind. If one, only one, listens to you, Alhamdulillah, it is khair. Some people, they say that Sheikh al Albani was not a scholar. Is this true? Alhamdulillah. Those who are saying this, tell him, have you read his books? Read his books and you'll find out whether he's a scholar or not. First of all, all his enemies, they know that he's the leading authority in the science of heaven. And go to their libraries, libraries and you'll find the books of Sheikh Al-Bani there. And when they want to know hadith weak or not, they go to the books of Al-Bani. For instance, all most of the, those who talk about Al-Bani, when they talk about Salat al tasabih they say, and Sheikh Al-Bani said it is a So they use his books. And when you read the books of Sheikh Al-Bani, you will understand. And you can see the, 
knowledge and the, the fiqh of the Shaykh. I remember once one of the brothers we were with the Shaykh and he said to the Shaykh, Shaykh, they are saying you are muhaddith and not faqih. You only know the hadith, but you don't know fiqh. So the Shaykh laughed and he said, I know every single evidence the fuqaha used. The, the evidence is they used to deduce the rulings. I know that what they base that ruling upon. What is the fiqh? The fiqh is Allah said, the Prophet said. What is it? The faqih, when he says it is haram, based on what? In his own opinion? Or because the Prophet sallallahu said? So a person, Sheikh Nasr al-Din al-Albani rahimahullah, more than half a century among the manuscripts. No one in this time served the Sunnah as he did. He served the Sunnah of the Prophet He checked all the hadith of the Prophet Now you can take Sahih ibn Majah, Sahih ibn Majah. Sahih Abu Dawood, Zaif Abu Dawood, Sahih Nasai, Zaif Nasai. He sifted the hadith and he checked the authenticities of the hadith. A person more than half a century among the manuscripts checking the hadith of the Prophet. His wife said that for the last 10 years he could hardly sleep. He sleeps only in the chair. The man is kept in front of him and he is writing. He compiled a book which is not printed yet. It contains 40,000 authentic hadith. Apart from the books which are printed. Read his books and then you know. But those who are attacking Albani, because they don't want us to benefit from his ilm. Because okay. out of jealousy. So anyone comes and says, have you read his books? Then read his books and you will know whether he's a scholar or not. They say he's a Hajami. He's not an Arab. So what? Bukhari was a Hajami. All the scholars of Hadith are Hajam. See my way, the grammarian. Huh? The Imam of the grammarians is not an Arab. Read his books, the books of Sheikh Nasser, Rahimahullah, and you will see whether he knows Arabic or not. So I guess people, they talk anything, <coughs> nonsense, without <coughs> thinking rationally and objectively. Somebody asks for a marriage reference then can I tell them about their past? No. You don't mention. Among the principles of the Sharia and Islam, a sitter covering up. When sitter a Muslim in the dunya, sitter a Allah of it. If you cover the faults of your brother here, Allah will cover your faults in the second life. So you don't mention. Even for marriage reference. Even about that. But what you mention, you mention what you know about the brother, like for instance, if he is not generous. Like for instance, he is a hot temper, very temperamental. Things that the wife needs to know. You should mention. As the woman came to the Prophet, and she said, Oh Prophet of Allah, three of the Sahaba proposed they want to marry me. And I'm confused, I don't know which one to choose. Muawiyah, Abu Jahan, and Usama. He said, don't marry Muawiyah because he is very poor. He doesn't have anything. No income. So this means you can discredit a brother if he's in Dole. Brother, the Dole can be discrediting him. First of all, go and get a job and earn. Right? So he said, Muawiyah, because some brothers, they want to marry the second wife, and he is not working. And I think that here only one wife is allowed, right? So the second wife, what to do? Hmm? 
she has to go and get the benefit, but she is pregnant. And I'm not married, and she is having the niqab. I'm not married. Who's putting the sister in that embarrassing position? This brother who doesn't fear Allah. So, he said, don't marry Muawiyah. And don't marry Abu Jahl. Because he beats the woman. So if you know this brother, you know, he was a boxer before or something. <laughs> huh? so no. Okay, he's a hot temper, so, so don't marry him. He said, Muawiyah Abu Jahl, he beats the woman. Then the third, he told her, marry Usama. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Should we watch TV as men look at women and women look at men? No. Don't watch TV. Because simply that is going to weaken your iman. If you are watching the television, what do you see? All types of rubbish. Women, to the extent now, watch, seeing a woman uncovered is normal, right? Shall I think, how are you watching? She is not covering. See, she, she no hair cover, nothing. She says, this is normal, okay. this is well, it's okay, nothing wrong with that. So the haram, and this is the danger about it, you become desensitized, you don't feel it. It becomes normal. Sheikh uh, Abu Shaf al Hawaini is one of the scholars in Hadith, and he is now one of the successors of Sheikh Nasser. He said, I was discussing with the, with the Muslim about television and the negative effects of the television, etc. Then he said to the Sheikh, Sheikh, did you see that, scene, that film? There was a film, movie, and the story of the movie that a uh, father died and uh, <clears throat> the brother, he left to the school to work and look after his sisters, then he he traveled to another country to work and he got all his sisters married. That's the story of the movie. And then at the end of the movie, he comes back, he returns home, and his sisters, they receive him in the airport and they kiss him. So the sheikh was discussing with him. And he told him, but he, they were hugging each other, kissing each other. He said, Sheikh, what's wrong with you? They are his sisters. They are his sisters. He said, you forgot that they, are, they were acting? <laughs> Understand? They put you in the environment that you accepted. Brother and sisters, when they are not. Are you following or not? Yeah. A man is kissing another woman who is not a mahram, is not his sister. But now they make you accept it. Akhi, it is halal. And he said, I was discussing with the person who was educated. I told him, the Satan of Mimathra? You forgot that they, are, they were acting? What sisters and brothers are you talking about? And then he said another story. He said, I was discussing with someone, and each time I asked him, what is this? He said, Iman is here. Iman is here. Everything is in the heart. Everything is in the heart. Then I told him, where is the beat? He said, in the heart. Even the beat inside the heart as well. So the heart becomes even the trash bag, yeah? the garbage bag. So everything in the heart, what is this? So television, believe me, television is the most destructive means nowadays. You cannot bring up your children Islamically if you have television. You cannot. Because the television will not help you to bring up your children, will it? Will the television help you? To not have. So let us face it, let us be realistic and practical and let us take something, practical steps to get rid of it. Can you explain the ruling behind Salat al-Tawbah and Salat al-Tasbih? Salat al-Tawbah, you pray two rak'ahs after every sin you do. If you commit a sin, go take wudu and pray to rak'ahs and ask Allah forgiveness, make a step. Salat al-Tasabih, it's hadith. There are many narrations. Some of the narrations are weak. 
And that's why you might come across on some books that Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said it is bid'ah. Because the narrations he came across are weak narrations. Or you might hear Sheikh al Uthameen saying it is not sunnah. But the truth about Salat al Tasabih, there are authentic narrations about it. There are authentic Islams. And Sheikh Nasruddin al Bani, he mentioned some of these Islams. And one of the students of Nali from Kuwait, he wrote a book, Al Tanqih fi Salat al Tasabih, where he compiled all the Islams about this Salat. So Salat al Tasabih is Sunnah. And it is for Rakah. And in each rak'ah, 75 times you make the tasbih. 15 when you are standing, first time, then 10, then 10, until you finish. So in each rak'ah, you will do 75. And believe me, it is a beautiful thing. Try it and see the impact of it and the effect of it. And the salaf, many, many of the salaf, they were praying and practicing the salaf to say. Is it permissible to read Surah Yasin or read the Quran in a group after somebody has died? This is reading the Quran when someone dies is bid'ah. It is bid'ah. This was never the practice of the Sahaba or the Prophet. Never. When someone dies, they drink, they get together reading the Quran and asking Allah to take the thawab and the reward to the soul of the person who passed away. This is bid'ah. And Imam Shafi'i said, لا ينتبع الميت بقراءة He said the dead person will not benefit from the recitation of the Quran. That's one. Number two, though some of the ulama, and you might hear this, that Ibn Taymiyyah said it's okay, Ibn Qayyim said it's okay, Shawkani said okay. Why they said okay? What is their proof? We are not following a scholar just like that. We follow the evidence. Because any scholar, his statement as Imam Malik said, can be accepted or rejected based on the evidence. Except the Prophet When we look through the evidence of those ulama, great scholars, they use the qiyas, the analogy. They say, since he can benefit but if someone performs the hajj on his behalf, that means the work of somebody else reaches him, then this is like that. They use the qiyas. And the qiyas cannot be accepted in the matters of ibadah. When it comes to the ibadah, no qiyas. No qiyas at all. The, the Prophet ﷺ, he allowed us to perform the hajj on someone's behalf. But he never read the Quran or anyone. He never. The Sahaba never, no one did that. Had it been permissible, at least the Prophet would have done it once. At least. The Prophet used to go to the graveyard. He never read the Fatiha. He never read Yasin. This proves that it is not permissible. Many of the Sahaba died. He never read the Quran for any one of them. The Sahaba died. None of the Sahaba did that. So this is an innovation. This is bid'ah. And people should leave it. Now, what if the son reads the Quran? Would that benefit the, the father or the mother? The answer is yes. Because the deeds of the child goes directly to the, into the records of the parents. I have been married for one year, living with my husband and his parents. His parents have thrown me out of the house. They are forcing my husband to divorce me for no valid reason. There are no problems between me and my husband. I am living separately from my husband for the last month, although we are meeting. He is living with his parents. He doesn't want to upset his parents, but wants to stay married to me. Please give me advice as to what to do. This should get her another house should rent a house for her, and he should not divorce his wife. He should not divorce his wife if she is pious, righteous, and just like that. Because sometimes the parents, especially the mother, especially the mother, she had someone in mind. 
maybe her niece. Okay? So she wanted you to marry that girl. And you didn't do that. So you married someone else. So she tries by all means to make this marriage huh, unsuccessful. So that you will marry that girl. Different mentalities. So if your wife is okay, don't divorce her. And don't listen to her. Some they say, but you know, the Prophet said to Umar ibn Khattab, to the son of Umar, listen to your father. You say, we have no problem. If our father is like Umar ibn Khattab, we will listen. <laughs> <laughs> if they are that pious and righteous like Umar ibn Khattab, yes, we will listen to them. If they told, tell us, divorce your wife. Because Umar, do you think Umar would tell his son, divorce this wife with no reason? Number one. Number two, the Prophet Sallallahu approved of that, right? He is the one who is telling now Ibn Umar, divorce your wife and listen to your father. That means what Umar was saying is what? Right. The same thing people now, they say, if you want to marry the second wife, they say, no, you will not do that, except if you divorce the first one. It's a condition that you divorce the first one. And then they tell you that the Prophet ﷺ did not allow Ali to marry a tribe of Fatima. As if they don't like Fatima. And they don't know that this is something was special for that girl, the daughter of the Prophet. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said it is impossible that the, the daughter of the Prophet and the daughter of the enemy of the Prophet be together. Fatima is part of me. What makes Fatima angry makes me angry. And Ali did not marry on top of Fatima. But immediately when the Prophet died, Fatima fell sick and after six months she died. And after that, he married many more. Next question. Yes. Sometimes a brother and sister, they get engaged to be married. And then they communicate by email and phone calls regularly until they get married. Is this wrong? Wrong. Engaged. Yeah. Or there is a habit. Uh, is there a habit? Many contracts, so they are husband and wife. Or just engaged. We don't have engagement in Islam. We don't have that. In Islam, you go and see the girl and immediately get married. So there is nothing the issue of fiancé and all these things. He's my fiancé and stuff like that. You don't have so she's here, is not her husband. So he should not talk to her. And who knows, this might lead to something haram. And then they will decide not to marry her. He will decide not to marry her. Uh, don't open this door. That's why sisters should be Allah and they should not love in the net and start chatting. Okay, because I receive many mails and many problems and because of the, the chat. Is it allowed to use cosmetic products which have alcohol in them? Avoid them as well. Leave what you doubt to that which you don't doubt. Uh, is it permissible for a married couple to show affection like kissing and hugging and holding hands in public? Kissing? And in public? No. <laughs> <laughs> in the bedroom only. <laughs> but uh, holding hands is fine. If they is holding her hands and they are moving. It's only some, some customs. And for instance, in the Arab world, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable that you hold the hand of a woman. But these are customs only. Customs. And that's why, if I says in the hajj, I have to hold her hand. Otherwise, I will lose her. Among the cloud, right? So, that is fine, no problem. But also, you have to take into consideration the, the norms and the oath of the community. If I now move to a community, and they don't hold the hand of the wives, and I'm doing this, 
people say, what sort of type of shape is this? <laughs> so I have to also take that into consideration. Well, what are the conditions of the hijab? And I've seen many sisters that wear hijab that looks attractive. And I've seen many, many wearing patterned or transparent hijabs. See, the Prophet when he described what would happen towards the end of time, he said there are two types of people whom I haven't seen. They will come after me. Men carrying whips like the tails of the cows, they beat the people. And they are there already. And women with their hair style like the humps of the camels. See, they call it the bun, they call it the... Huh? A woman will uh, uh, accumulate the hair on top of her head or tie it up behind. So, they are like the humps, and some they are exactly like the humps. Exactly like this. So he said, women will come and they are dressed and yet naked. They are dressed, but at the same time they are naked. You see that or not? That's the, it was difficult for the Sahaba to, to imagine this. But for us it's not difficult. And then they are trying to seduce men. When they walk, they walk seductively, swaying their bodies. They are swaying the bodies when they are moving. And they wear long heels too. So that her body, you know, how it looks. So this is what the Prophet said. So the hijab of the Muslim should be loose, should be covering her body, should not describe her body. You should not see how big the figure of her body. That's the hijab of the Muslim. It should not be attractive. It should not be transparent. It should not be at, uh, attracting the, the passers-by. That is the, these are the characteristics of the hijab. Should we believe in black magic and ta'weed and could this harm people? The black magic is true. And the sihr is there. And, the and whoever denies the sihr will become kafir. And the sihr affects the people. The spell affects. But it is by the leave of Allah Azza wa Jal. So, but the prevention, prevention is better than cure. So how to protect ourselves from the sihr? The Prophet ﷺ said, if you eat seven days every day, the sihr will not harm you. Every day you eat seven days in the morning. Any day, not necessarily adwa from the dinner, no. Any day. But this is a cure. And also the ruqya, you read in yourself, I feel kursi, qul wallah wahad, qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, every night. And you do the same thing also for your children. Then inshallah the sihr will not harm you. But it is there and it has it, uh, an uh, impact, it, it affects by the leave of Allah Azza wa Jal. Regarding the ta'weedah, it is not permissible to write ayat from the Qur'an and then you tie them around the neck. This is not permissible. What is permissible that you read on the children, as the Prophet ﷺ used to read in Al-Hasan and al yes. uh, In the Jum'ah Khutbah, when the Imam uh, sits in the middle, is this a time to make dua? Is this between the two khutbahs? Yeah, from the Sunnah, no. There's nothing in the Sunnah about that. Uh, another question regarding the hijab, that should a woman not look smart and neat? Smart, yes. Neat, yes. But at the same time, she should obey Allah and not disobey Him. So she should wear a hijab that pleases Allah, not pleases the human beings. So what matters here, whom, whom should you please, Allah or the passers-by? That's what matters. Just a few questions regarding and if you miss uh, reading Surah Al-Fatiha when you're praying with the Imam, do you have to make up an extra rakah? 
Okay. This is a problematic question. <laughs> okay. Some, because the issue of reading the part you have, there are two opinions. One says you have to read it, and this is the madhab of Imam Bukhari, and also Ahlul Hadith. Okay. Based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, No salah for the one who doesn't read the Fatiha. And his salah is incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. So they said you have to read the Fatiha even if the Imam is reading. You have to read it. This is one of them. But also there's another one. Abu Huraira said, we used to read behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he told us, does anyone read? He said, yes. He said, don't read anything except the fact. And so after that, he told them, don't read anything. And Abu Huraira said, and we left the reading. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man kana lahu imam al imam lahu The one who has an imam, playing behind an imam, loud prayers, then the reading of the imam is his reading. His reading on his behalf. And this hadith authenticated by Shaykh al-Bani, and this is many schools they are applying like this. Sheikh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said here if you hear the recitation of the Imam, just listen to the Imam. Because he is reading with your behalf. If you cannot read, hear his recitation, then you, you read. And especially this, uh, in the loud prayer, silent prayer is no problem, you read. So if you hold the opinion that you have to read, then read. Then you read Surah al bad Now the question, what if I miss the rak'ah? That means I joined the Imam in the report, so I didn't read the Quran. Does that rak'ah count or not? Can I count that rak'ah? I found the Imam in the report. And he said, Allahu Akbar. And I managed to say, Subhana Rabbi al azim at least once. Can I count that? According to the hadith of the Prophet he said, you count it. He said, you count it and you uh, build upon it. And Allah knows best. Uh, Mr. Mahmoud, can you uh, summarize the ruling about leaving the land of the disbelievers and making hijrah the lands of the Muslims. This is a long topic, <laughs> okay? But hijrah, my dear brothers and sisters, is a must. And I will mention only two hadiths. One hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, I have washed my hands of every Muslim living among the disbelievers. The second hadith says, Allah will not accept from any revert, any Muslim, person became a Muslim and he lives among the kuffar, anything from him or her till he leaves the land of God. So there are many, many ahari, very scary. So you need to take the issue seriously and at least you should have the niyyah, the intention to move. Hijrah is a must, hijrah is not. And you know, do you feel that your children are safe? Can you discipline your child? Can you smack your child? Tell me. Can you? Can you apply the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Can you apply this hadith? That smack your child. Command him to pray at the age of seven and smack him at the age of ten. Can you do it? You will lose your child, right? They will take your child away. So it is now because we love the dunya, because we start loving the dunya, so complacent, so content. So we don't want to, uh, to do a sacrifice. So the hadith about the hijrah are very low. Now. My husband does not want to grow the beard as he works with non-Muslims. Okay. Just pray for him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen his human child. Uh, what advice would you give to people who regularly miss Salat al Fajr? Uh, the, the best advice for them, first of all, to sleep early. 
and go to bed early and try to have the, the near and the intention sincerely that they want to get up for the Fajr. Try to use uh, different means, somebody to call him, a brother to call me, to call him, to wake him for the Fajr. Put many clocks and keep them away from you. So the first one you hit, the second one all starts ringing. Tell all your sleep is spoiled. So then you go up, get up and go to the masjid. And immediately when you immediately when you hear the alarm, get up and say, Ahuzi Billah Mishabadi. Asbahna asbaha al-Mulkulullah. So that the first knock will be untied. Then get up and start taking wudu. So the second knot, knot will be untied. Then go to the masjid and inshallah you'll have a beautiful day. Uh, also, his wife can help him, coming to him, massaging him, for oh, my husband, beautiful husband, barakallah being, get up for the fajr, jazakallah khairan, not you, hypocrite, get up. <laughs> can we eat the meat from the supermarket? If this meat is slaughtered by Muslims, yes. But if it, you don't know, go and look for the halal. Uh, what advice would you give to a righteous wife whose husband refuses to financially provide for her such that she has to pay for everything herself? Should they separate? I'm not one of the advocates of talaq. I don't encourage people to go for talaq. Okay, so she should talk to her husband. She should, they should discuss this matter. And if she has children and she is ready to sacrifice, it's better with her for her to stay with her husband rather than being divorced. Is it hard on me to serve my husband's parents, or should I just do it out of goodwill? This question, when the people they say, is it incumbent, is it obligatory upon the wife to serve her husband personally? Unfortunately, many mashayikh, they come here and they spoil the women. They pamper the women. And they tell them, you know, it is not obligatory, it's not compulsory to serve your husband, to cook for him, or do anything. You are the queen sitting at home, so he has to bring you a maid, servant, etc. Who said that? It's not the truth. The truth is the opposite. The Sahabi yad, they were serving and helping the husband and doing everything. The daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Fatima has said, she came to her father and she found many men around him. So she went to her house. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and he found them, they are ready to sleep, Ali and Fatima. He said, Fatima, what is it? Why did you come? She kept quiet. Ali said, I told her to go and ask you to give us a servant to help us. Because she cannot meet, she cannot do the chores by herself. She fits, brings the water, carrying the, the water, grinding the, 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 the weed, till the, the handle of the grinder made this down blisters in her hand, and she does everything. What did the Prophet ﷺ say to Ali? Had it been not obligatory, he would have said, Ali, fear Allah, treat my daughter justly. Don't you know that you have, you have no right? It's not her duty to do this. But the Prophet ﷺ said the opposite. He said, he turned to his daughter, said, Fatima, taqillah. Fatima, be Allah. Don't ask for that. Do your duty. So it is the duty. And now the women, what do they do? Tell me. What do they do? The sweep, the hoover doesn't. Huh? There's the hoover. Dishwashers. Wa and uh, washing machines. Everything is there. Blenders. Food processor. What do they do? Wasting time with their nail polish and stuff like that? That's what they do. 
They have to do their duties. Subhanallah. The old generation, the mothers, at dawn, before dawn, they get up. You want me to, to do what? So if you really love me, you'll love my mother. And my mother is your mother. And if you treat my mother nicely, your mother-in-law and the, your, your daughter-in-law will treat you nicely. Because you treated your mother-in-law nicely. I think uh, time is up. The last one. Okay, uh, the last question is that um, somebody in the family has committed a major sin and everybody is boycotting this person. Is this right? Even though the person has repented. Boycotting, in, especially in our time, is not a good thing. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So it's better that this person who's committing the sin, we just give him da'wah, give him nasiha, be nice to him, pray for him, and tell him, Allah, Allah, that him. And since he repented, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> uh, what advice would you give to brothers marrying sisters and divorcing them for no reason? Just using the sunnah as an excuse. It's not the sunnah. This is not the sunnah. You just marry a woman and then you divorce her the second time. Who said this is the sunnah? And that's why this should discredit this brother. So that's why I tell him this, brother, don't get your giving your daughter. After one week you will divorce her. Don't accept him. Uh, should women cover their feet during prayer? And do they have to wear the jilbab or is it permissible to wear just loose baggy clothing? Yeah. The the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith Al Mar'atu Awa. The entire body of the woman is our. So yes, everything should be covered except her hands and her face in the salah. So her feet should be covered in the salah as well. And whoever claims that the feet is not our, he should bring an evidence to exclude. Because the Prophet said, the entire body is our. So if he's saying it's not our, produce your evidence. Come, show us. Next. A family member becomes murtad apostates, what rights do they have over you? If a family member apostates, uh, what right do they have over you? The parents. You know, if somebody in the family becomes murtad. This murtad, we have to give him da'wah. Does this person have any right over the Muslims? We give him da'wah. We give him da'wah because there is no hukum shar'i where the hukum will be established and it will be executed, etc. Uh, you mean the hands? No, no. In the salah only, in the salah, women can show the face and the hand. But outside, the best thing is the kafa. And that's why the women, they were wearing gloves at the time of the Prophet And that's why the Prophet said, لا تنتقب المحرمة ولا تلبس القفازين A woman in the state of Ihram, in the Hajj, she doesn't wear the niqab or the gloves, which means outside the Hajj, she wears it, yes. Is it permissible to carry a, a baby wearing a nappy during the during the prayer? Yeah, very permissible. And this is alhamdulillah, mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A mother, she wants to pray, and the child is crying. She can carry the child and pray. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to carry Zainab in the masjid. And he was leading the Muslims. And he would go to Ruku and put to the, his, his granddaughter, and then picks her up. Uh, is it, uh, what's the shortest length a woman can cut her hair? To the extent that she will not look, uh, she will not look like a man. The moment that she will start to look like a man, it is haram. That's why they say to, to the heroes here. More than that one. But this is here cutting the hair. That subhanAllah, I don't know what's happening to the woman. The woman now, the fitra has changed. The fitra, the woman they like. Long hair, that's the fitra. But now they are following the kafir woman. So they want whatever the kafir woman do, they want to do like them. That's why they ask, can I put a button here and button there? What is this? Because whatever the kafir women are doing, they want to do the same. But if she says, but I cannot do my hair and it's giving me tough time and stuff like that, then she can cut it up to the end of something, up to the shoulders.
Uh, is it permissible to take a second wife without telling the first one? Yes, it is permissible. Who said that he has to seek the permission of the first one? But he has to be a real man. <laughs> strong enough that he will look after the two families and he will withstand all the pressure. Because the first one will use all her weapons. Okay? To make you kneel. So you have to prepare yourself for the battle. I think we've uh, covered the vast majority of questions. Let's request the Sheikh to say a few words regarding fundraising for our centre, which uh, inshallah we hope to uh, establish sometime in the future. My dear brothers and sisters, as you know, this deen requires and needs sacrifices. And the early Muslims, they sacrificed a lot. And that's why the deen reached us. They gave their lives, they gave their wealth, they gave everything. They gave everything. He said, even that. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Abi Suhail al-Rumi, when he left Mecca, the Mushriks followed him. They followed him. And they said, you came to us very poor, and now we want to migrate to Medina, taking the money. He told them, I'm not taking anything. You want the money? It's there, don't take it. He told them where the money is. <coughs> Otherwise, if you are looking for trouble, you know, you know me very well. The quiver is full of arrows. And every arrow in the heart of one of you. So you choose, what do you want? You want, you want troubles? I'm ready for it. You want the money? It is there. He said, no, no, we only want the money. And he left, so he left the money, everything. And he went to Medina. What did the Prophet tell him? The deal you made with Allah was very profitable. Very profitable. So there were sacrifices for the deal. So this deal needs men. It needs a lot of sacrifices. And among these sacrifices, the money, the financial aspect. So we have to contribute. Don't you know, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah Azza wa Jal sends down every day two angels. One of them says, Allahumma aqil munfiqan khalafa. Oh Allah, give the one who spends more. Compensate him more. Make his business boom. The other one saying, Allahumma aqil munfiqan khalafa. Oh Allah, the one who would hurt. Destroy his wealth every day. And the Prophet ﷺ said, ما نقص مال من صدقة قط. Your money, your wealth will never be de diminished, will never reduce by giving the sadaqah. It will multiply. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, العبد في ظل صدقته يوم القيامة. Everyone will be in the shade of his charity in the day of resurrection, when the sun will be above the heads. Everyone is looking for shade. So if you are giving sadaqah, you will have shade. And this shade will be proportional to the sadaqah used to give. So let us have the habit of giving sadaqah on daily basis. Your salary, you take portion of it, certain percentage. Every month, this is the sadaqah. Apart from the zakah, sadaqah. And you give sadaqah every day. So, I appeal to all of you, I request all of you, inshallah, to inshallah, contribute unanimously, inshallah, for this center, inshallah. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your sadaqah. Allah will multiply it until he makes it equal to the size of the Mount of Uhud, inshallah.
First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Shaykh, mashallah, who's uh, made a lot of effort to come here today. May Allah reward him immensely on the Day of Judgment. I mean. uh, the Shaykh also mentioned his email address. Can you just uh, repeat the email address again? S-A-L-A-M-R-Y at Hotline. S-A-L-A-M-R-Y at Hotline. And the site, Ibrahim Screen, I-B-R-A-H-E-E-M-S. And S cream C R W E D dot com where you can download the terms and such. Also, inshallah, the Sheikh is uh, coming again to the UK in August. So, we hope to uh, invite him again if he accept our invitation.